Captain, revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for our Wednesday evening Bible study this week. We're counting down the days when we can meet together again in person and study from the Word of God and worship Him. And when that time comes, we hope that you'll consider being our guest here at our building as we conduct our regular services. Let's go ahead and get into our Bible study tonight. And as we do that, let me say that there are some things in this old world that are just plain old dangerous. Let me tell you about something that happened to me many years ago. When I was a young firefighter with the Atwood, Tennessee Fire Department, we were dispatched to a mobile home fire one day in a mobile home park just on the outskirts of town. And when we arrived, we began to put water on the fire as you would do. And, and I was standing there holding the hose and, and as I stood there, there was something that I had not noticed. I had not looked up and saw a power line just above my head. And so while I was standing there, that power line fell at my feet. And it began arcing and dancing around with hundreds of volts of electricity. And I want you to know my heart jumped into a place that it shouldn't be as I jumped out of the way of that power line. Well, you know what? That was a very dangerous thing. I could have lost my life right there at that point. And so from that day forward for almost 20 more years, whenever we rolled up on a fire scene, I always made sure where the power lines were. And so the power company, of course, would come out and they would, they would make sure that everything was cut off at, uh, when they could get there. But, but I wanted to know for certain that I was safe and that our other firefighters were safe as well. Well, you know, power lines are not the only things that are dangerous. And uh, Timothy was told by Paul about something. And, and we still have that dangerous thing that we can read about today. And so if you have your copy of God's Word, I hope that you'll open it and turn with me tonight as we study together. Please turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 6, and let's look together at verse number 9. 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verse number 9. There the Bible says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Did you notice the last part of that verse? How that riches can plunge people into these dangerous situations to the ruin and the destruction of not just their life, but of even their soul. Uh, if you could continue on in verse number 10, Paul continues his thought and says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many pangs. If you think about it, you may have known families who have been torn asunder because parents have died and, and children have fought over the, the remains, the things that have been left by them. And, and it's not just at that time. Money causes us a lot of heartache, a lot of grief, doesn't it? Or at least it can cause those things. And so it can be a dangerous, dangerous thing but I want to focus more on the soul part. I want, to, I want us to think about that. In the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 23 and 24, Jesus had something to say about money and things of, uh, that, that are associated with wealth. He said, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus didn't say that it was impossible for a rich person to enter into heaven. He said it's with a lot of difficulty. It's all of that baggage that Paul wrote about, the things that, that people have, the love of money that, that pulls people away from God. Uh, Paul would also talk about how that, that covetousness, which is the desire to have money and other things is idolatry, and so we substitute those things for God. 
But about right now, you're probably wondering and, and, and thinking, well, do I need to keep on watching this particular Bible study? Uh, I'm not rich, uh, and I don't love money, and, and all I want to do is, is provide for my family. That's, that's my goal in life, is just to have enough to provide for my family. Well, let me just say right here that that is a very, very noble thing. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 5, at verse number 8, Paul wrote and said, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And then again, in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, at verse number 10, he would write, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And so as we look at it, it's a noble thing to want to work. It's a noble thing to want to take care of our families. That's what God expects from us. But I want you to understand tonight that this lesson is still for you. It's still for all of us. And I still want to call our attention to, to some things in this lesson. First of all, let me call your attention to passage in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, these words, of course, being spoken by Jesus. Again, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Matthew, chapter 6, and we'll begin reading in verse 19. There the Bible says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also." Now, I'm sure most all of us have heard this passage, uh, but what, if anything, about this passage is relevant to us? What, what does it mean to each one of us, especially at this current time and in this current situation? Well, let's talk about a couple of things tonight that it probably means to us, and, and especially at this particular time. We need to ask a question. Why should I lay up my treasure in heaven? Now, one reason for that is this. Earthly treasures are of a material nature. Now, what does that mean? Well, material things are things that are perishable. They're likely to decay or to go bad. And that's why he said the moth and the rust, they destroy these things. I don't know if you've ever thought about it or not, but your earthly treasures are just like your physical life. In the book of James, chapter 4, at verse number 14, James would write these words, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Now here's the point. Talking about those riches, those things, that, those treasures that we have here on this earth, he said that the moth and the rust, they destroy these things. But James wrote and said that our life vanishes away. Now here's the kicker, the word destroy and the word vanish, the word destroy back in Matthew and the word vanish here in the book of James are different forms of the same word in the original language. And so that's my point. You know, we don't know from one day to the next if we're going to be alive. We don't know in the morning if we're going to bed that night. We don't know at night if we're going to wake up in the morning. Our life is fragile. Old people die, and we expect older people to die, but so do babies, and so do young people, teenagers, and so do middle-aged people. And so our life is fragile. And just like our life is fragile and it vanishes away, so it is with our uh, earthly goods, the, the treasures that we have here on this earth. And so they're perishable. They, they are earthly in nature. Earthly treasures, not only that, but earthly treasures can be taken away from us. You know, we put our, our treasures in heaven so that they'll be safe because our earthly treasures can be taken away. Uh, Jesus said that thieves can break in and steal. You know, it's a uh, it's a disheartening thing and, and a thing that will make you angry when you come and you find someone has broken in and stolen your stuff. 
That's not a, that's not a good feeling at all. And, and some of us have experienced that in the past. But it's not always thieves that take away things, is it? Uh, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Nehemiah with me in the Old Testament. And we're going to be looking at a, about five verses there. It's in the days of Nehemiah that the Bible talks about how that there was an outcry that arose from the poor people who were in Jerusalem at that time. Now, understand that they had been in captivity. They had been in Babylonian captivity, and they had returned from that captivity, and God had given them some instructions, some things to do about rebuilding the wall and about rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed when the Babylonians came against them. But uh, these people began to, uh, to cry out because of something that was happening. Now, Nehemiah chapter one, 5, verses 1 beginning, Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against the Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters, we are many. So let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's taxes on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we're forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. Now you think about what's going on there. They're in a, in a dire situation. There's a famine that's going on, and, and they were having a hard time providing for themselves. And it seems that it was not of their making. Now, it could be argued as we study through the book of Nehemiah that it was because of uh, of things that they were not doing that God had told them to do. And, and yet I want us to think about the fact that, that they're, they're mortgaging the things that they own and, and they simply are having a hard time making ends meet. Ever been in that position? Having a hard time making ends meet? Now that's what's happening here. Now, now what was the problem? Well, the problem was not because somebody had broken in their houses and stolen the things. Drop on down to verse number 7 in Nehemiah chapter 5, and let's read. Nehemiah writes and says, I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, You are exacting interest each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them. You see... It was against God's law at that time for them to be charging interest. It was against God's law for them to be abusing their fellow Jews in that way. In the book of Exodus chapter 22 at verse 25, Moses wrote, If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. That wasn't wrong to charge interest. You know, a money lender could do that, but a Jew could not, could not charge another Jew interest. That was what God had told them that they could not do. But that's what they were doing. And the people had gotten themselves in so deep that they were having problems making ends meet. It, it was a hard situation. Their children were going into slavery. They were, they were selling off their children in order to get things to eat. That was a a hard, hard time. You know what? We put our treasures in heaven because thieves break in and steal, and it's not just because of thieves. It's situations like we're in today when people can't work, when things will not allow us, when, when, when the situation of life won't allow us to go about the normal activities of life. Now, and it may be that someone gets sick and that situation arises. It may be that, that you have an accident and, and that situation arises. But we all know and we understand that there are hard times that come. Now, a lot, a lot of us are not used to having hard times. We're living in the richest nation in the world. And we want things when we want them. We want them now. We want it instantly Sometimes things just don't work that way. 
we've got to put our treasure in the right place. Now, the reason we put our treasure in heaven is that none of these things can happen. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Peter wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now watch this in verse number 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. You see, when your treasure is in heaven, nothing that happens on earth can devastate you because your treasure is there. And where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. When your treasure is in heaven, let me repeat that, nothing that happens on earth can devastate you. Are you close to being devastated? Have you asked yourself, where am I putting my treasures? Where are my treasures? Let me get you to think about something with me from the book of Hebrews chapter 10. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 32, the writer of the book of Hebrews talks to those to whom he has addressed this letter, and he is uh, trying to convince them not to leave Christianity, that Christianity and Christ is better. Now notice in verse number 32 that he says, But recall the former days when after you were enlightened you endured a hard struggle with sufferings sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you, watch this, joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. How did those Christians in the first century, how did they allow themselves without just turning completely against Christ and, about, uh, and against Christianity? How was it that they were able to watch their, watch their things being taken from them and, and go through the suffering brought about by that and other sufferings that were uh, uh, carried out against them? How were they to do that? They knew where their treasure was. They knew that it was in heaven. They knew that they had their treasure there and that no matter what happens here on this earth, they still had treasure. They knew where it was and they knew where their home was. And that's really the way that we should be, is it not? That was written down so that you and I could have that example and have that knowledge to know how we're to act, not in the first century, but in the 21st century century. Folks, let me tell you, storms of this life are going to come. And, and, and even though they come, if our treasures, if, if what we value most is in heaven, these storms cannot overwhelm us. You see, we can be like David, King David in the Old Testament, when his own son was trying to kill him. He wrote these words in Psalm 3 verse 5, he said, I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I hope your faith is strong enough that you can lay down and sleep like David did, knowing that God, no matter what happens, will sustain us. He's there for us. And even if our life on this earth ends, if we put our treasure in the right place, oh, it'll be waiting for us for certain. Now, having discussed that, let's ask another question. How can I lay up my treasure in heaven? How can I do that? Let me suggest to you that first of all that we have to become children of God if we want to put our if we want to put our treasures there. Romans chapter 8 beginning at verse 16, the Bible says, "The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order 
that we may also be glorified with Him. You do know what an heir is, don't you? That's someone who inherits something. But God has everything. And we can be a joint heir, one who is on a, on a level with Christ in inheriting the things that God gives us. But he says, guess what? In order for you to do that, you have to live for him and you have to suffer with him, if you will, in order to be able to claim the inheritance that you've been given. And so we need to become children of God. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have to be born into the family of God. In the book of John, chapter 3, beginning at verse 3, Jesus was talking to a man by the name of Nicodemus. And beginning in verse 3, the Bible says, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless, is, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And then Jesus answered him. He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What does he mean by being born of water and the Spirit? I want you to continue reading. I'm not going to do it for you tonight, but I want you to continue reading in the book of John, chapter number 3. And as you continue reading, I want you to find the first place that talks about water in John chapter 3. And it's there you'll come to understand what Jesus is talking about when he says one is born of water. Because down in that chapter, he begins to talk about how Jesus baptized in water and how John baptized in water. You see, that's how we're born into the family of God. We're born of water. We're born from baptism. We're born of the Spirit, being taught, of course, through the Word of God that has been given by the Spirit. And so we, we ourselves need to be born into the family of God. Now, we don't have time tonight to deal with that in great detail, but let me just say this. If you would like to know more about how to become a child of God, I would love to sit down with you and spend as much time as we need in, in looking at the Word of God with you in regard to that. But tonight, we simply need to become a child of God. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, at verse number 3, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Indeed, the inheritance, the blessings that we enjoy in those heavenly places, those, those, those places that we will spend eternity, they're found in Christ. And the only way one gets into Christ, into the family of God, is by being baptized in the book of Galatians. Chapter 3, the Bible says we're the children of God by faith in Him. For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so tonight, you see, the blessings are in Christ. And that's where we need to be. That's where our blessings are. That's where our treasures are. And so in order to lay up treasures there, we've got to be a child of God. But tonight, let me also suggest to you that what we need to do in order to lay up treasures in heaven is to use what we have to bless those who are around us. Look at Matthew chapter 19, if you will. There's a man who comes to Jesus. He thinks he's doing pretty good. Here's a man who's rich, the Bible says. And he says that he'd kept the Old Testament Ten Commandments because that's the, that's the law that he lived under. And the Bible says in verse 21 that Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, complete, mature, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor. Now watch this. And you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. This man thought more of his earthly treasure than he thought of his heavenly treasure. He went away sorrowful. But Jesus said, if you want to put your treasures there, 
Go sell what you have. Get rid of that which is holding you back. Put your treasures in heaven. Go help others and follow me. And so that's an example to us. In the book of Luke chapter 12, verses 33 and 34, Jesus would tell his own disciples, he said, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Again, it's to looking to the needs and helping others. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, the Apostle Paul wrote, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be not haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and, and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Again, the concept is to lay the treasures in heaven by using what we have to help those who are around us. In the book of Acts, chapter 10, at verse 35, the Bible says, In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how He Himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Indeed, that's a way that we lay up treasures in heaven by thinking about and helping others. Sometimes folks need financial help, don't they? But sometimes the need that they have is not of, uh, a, a, of a financial nature. Sometimes it's a spiritual need that they have. And so we can use what we have in order to help get the message of God's Word to them, to help them understand the truth of God's Word so they too can be laying up treasures in heaven. As we close, there are many who are going through some hard times right now because of things that have been shut down and, and all of the things that are going on that are not according to our own plans. They're not what we thought. They're not how we laid things out. And, and so folks are going through hard times. But as I think about that and I think about people today, I want to read you a story a story about some people who were also going through some hard times themselves. And, and even in their hard times, according to what we've studied this evening, they were laying up treasures in heaven. The story is found in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let's read verses 1 through 5. Paul wrote and said, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. What a great example recorded for us by inspiration that God would talk about these people who were going through so much. They gave according to what they had and they went above and beyond. But the reason they could do that is they weren't thinking about themselves. They wanted to help Others. They wanted to help their brothers and sisters in Christ who were also suffering. There are a lot of good people in Walker County and, and other places throughout our world. They'd give you the shirt off their back, and I'm thankful for that. And as we think about that, we know that, you know, that makes us happy. We're blessed to give in that way when we, when we can. 
But the only way these people could give like they gave that we read about here in the book of, uh, of uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, the only way they could do that is that they had given themselves first to God. Isn't that what we said tonight? That if we want to lay up treasures in heaven and, and, and we lay up treasures in heaven by helping others, the only way we can do that is by becoming a child of God and by living in accordance with the rules of God. And because of that, the treasures that they had down here, that didn't really matter to them. What mattered to them was the treasures they were storing up in heaven. And so I ask you one final time tonight, where is your treasure? Think about that. Let's close with a prayer. Holy and righteous Father in heaven, again we approach your throne. Thankful, Father, for everything that you do for us, for the blessings that we enjoy. Father, we pray for those who are going through hard times right now. We pray for their health and their safety, but we pray for their financial health as well. But Father, even more than that, we pray that we will understand where our treasure needs to be. Not here on this earth, but laid up with you, where we will spend eternity with our treasures that are there. Father, continue to help us to to have hearts that are willing to do that. And Father, may we learn more about what you would have us to do. Father, we pray for your church throughout the world. We pray for its leaders. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our, the leaders of our nation. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that, that they can uh, do things so that we can go about the activities that, that we normally do in, in making a living and providing for our families and helping others as well. Father, be with those who are sick. Help them, those who have undergone surgeries. Help them to recover. Father, be with those who have lost loved ones. And we pray for strength and courage as they face the days, the weeks, and the months that are ahead. Continue to be with us, Father, if it's according to your will. Forgive us when we sin, for this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And now a few announcements you might like to know. We extend our condolences to Deb Bray and family in the passing of her cousin, Johnny Hill. His funeral was today. We are recording these announcements early, and so we do not have an update, but Kathy Gunter was scheduled to undergo knee replacement surgery today. Please remember her as she undergoes this and recovers. If there's anything you need help with during this difficult time, please do not hesitate to let Mark or one of the elders know. We want to be here for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're in need of the Lord's Supper supplies or collection envelopes, please contact one of our elders or Mark, and we will be happy to arrange for you to receive these items. Again, for our members, our online giving is available to you. Simply go to midwaycfc.com slash giving. If you have announcements we need to make, you may email them to office at midwaycfc.com or you may either call or text Mark or Caitlin. And as we close, our prayer is that you will have a great rest of the week this week. Thank you for joining us. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again.